come now to the 31st session here at the British Columbian Camp 1983 and um, because of the baptismal arrangements which leaves us a little short of the full study period time we'll now spend a few moments in questions and answers it's quite common of course to have a question and answer period during our camps and um, I'm sure this morning some of you folk may have some questions that you'd like to raise or even some thoughts you'd like to offer in regard to what we've been through during the week which has passed. Before we do invite questions, I'd like to just um, mention something that Sharon gave me uh, yesterday. It was Isaiah chapter 18, wasn't it, Sharon? 18, what was the verse? 18, verse 8. Let's turn to this reference. It's a very encouraging one for parents, and one of the highlights of the camp meetings this year, of course, has been the... 818. Oh, 818, right. If you remember the right way. <laughs> Isaiah 8 and verse 18. And one of the highlights of um, probably one of the very brightest spots in this year's camp meetings here and back in California is the way in which the Spirit of God has worked for our children and some very real conversions have taken place uh, amongst very little children. And uh, we've seen the Spirit of Obedience take the place of the Spirit of Disobedience. Of course, we must not forget that there's a great work of training the establishing of new habit patterns and to achieve this of course the parents need to draw very close to their children with a very deep heart of love themselves and Sharon brought this text forward and I'd like to uh, pass on to you folk as well this morning verse 18 Isaiah chapter 8 behold I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion now I'd like to connect this with the statement and desire of ages and one in Christ I'll be listening. What was the page in Christ I'll be listening again, Sharon? I think it was 196, but I'm not sure. 196, I'll check it out if that's your have. Um, the last one is found, you mean, right? We'll stop 196, it's... Uh, it's not uh, the last... It's not 196, I don't think. Would you like to pass this back to Sharon and have her find the place for me? And while she's looking, I'd like to direct your attention to page 407 in the book Desire of Ages. Page 407, which deals with a chapter entitled The True Sign. And you'll notice that in this particular text from, um, from Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18, it says... Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Now, talking about the kind of sign that God uh, has planted in the church and which he expects us to recognize in the church, I turn now to page 407 in the book Desire of Ages. When the message of truth is presented in our day, there are many who, like the Jews, cry, show us a sign, work us a miracle. Christ wrought no miracle at the demand of the Pharisees. He wrought no miracle in the wilderness in answer to Satan's insinuations. He does not impart to us power to vindicate ourselves or to satisfy the demands of unbelief and pride. But the gospel is not without a sign of its divine origin. Right? The gospel is not without a sign of its divine origin. Now what is that sign? And here is the answer. Is it not a miracle that we can break from the bondage of Satan? Is that a miracle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Enmity against God, is, uh, be pardon, enmity against Satan is not natural to the human heart. <clears throat> it is implanted by the grace of God. When one who has been controlled by a stubborn, wayward will is set free. Now what's another expression for a stubborn, wayward will? The spirit of disobedience, right? So when we can we can now naturally of course in the past we thought of this text in relationship to older people to ourselves at our own age level but um, now now we, <coughs> now we find the application comes of course to little children as well so when a little child even a baby who has been controlled by a stubborn wayward will is set free and yields himself wholeheartedly to the drawing of God's heavenly agencies a miracle is wrought. So also when a man who has been under strong delusion comes to understand moral truth. 
every time a soul is converted and learns to love God and keep his commandments the promise of God is fulfilled a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you Ezekiel 36 and verse 26 the change in human hearts the transformation of human characters is a miracle that reveals never ever living saviour working to rescue souls a consistent life in Christ is a great miracle and note this last two sentences very carefully because this, this now talks about the sign you're to look for and when you recognise the presence of this sign you, you are to know that that is the sign of the, um, the working of God's grace in your heart found it? <clears throat> very good I'll, I'll read it after I read this last sentence in the paper thank you, thank you very much 194 now <clears throat> the statement goes on to say in the preaching of the word of God right in that preaching the sign that should be manifest now and always is the presence of the Holy Spirit to make the word a regenerating power to those that hear this is God's witness before the world to the divine mission of his son so when Isaiah 8 and verse 18 says that we and our children shall be for signs and for wonders then what is that sign it is the presence of the Holy Spirit to make the word a regenerating power now what is regeneration well in, it, it, let's, let's talk of regeneration in terms of the spirit of disobedience and the spirit of obedience what does the regenerating power of the spirit do in respect to the spirit of disobedience removes it. it removes it and what, what does it do in respect to the spirit of obedience it gives it, it, gives it. so when we see in response to the prayer of faith on the part of the parents a tra this transformation takes place in the child so that um, the spirit of disobedience is removed and replaced by the spirit of obedience then that is the sign that should, be, that should be present and will be present wherever the gospel is truly preached in its purity and power right that's the sign now there's a comment on this text Isaiah 8 and verse 18 in the book Christ Object Lessons and um, I find it here right begins on page 195 and goes across to page 196 but those who have been guilty of neglect are not to despair now this is of course the neglect is in regard to the lost coin the chapter is called this man received the sinners and perhaps I shall go back um, a little earlier to pick up the context of this particular little paragraph the coin though lying among dust and rubbish is a piece of silver still its owner seeks it because it is of value so every soul however degraded by sin is in God's sight accounted precious as the coin bears the image and superscription of the, of the reigning power so man at his creation bore the image and superscription of God and though now marred and dimmed through the influence of sin the traces of this inscription remain upon every soul God desires to recover that soul and to, and to retrace upon it his own image of, in righteousness and holiness. The woman in the parable searches diligently for her, her lost coin. She lights the candle and sweeps the house. She removes everything that might have struck her search. Though only one piece is lost, she will not cease her efforts until that piece is found. So in the family, if one member is lost to God, every means should be used for his recovery. On the part of all the others, let there be diligent, careful self-examination, let the life practice be investigated, see if there is not some mistake, some error in management by which that soul is confirmed in impenitence. If there is in the family one child who is unconscious of his sinful state, parents should not rest, let the candle be lighted. Search the word of God, and by its light let everything in the home be diligently examined to see why this child is lost. That parents search their own hearts, examine their habits and practices. Children are the heritage of the Lord, and we are answerable to Him for our management of His property. That's a very solemn responsibility, of course. There are fathers and mothers who long to labour in some foreign mission field. There are many who are active in Christian work outside the home, while their own children are strangers to the Saviour and His love. The work of winning their children to Christ, many parents trust to the minister or the Sabbath school teacher but in doing this they are neglecting their own God-given responsibility. The education and training of their children to be Christians is the highest service that parents can render to God. 
It is a work that demands patient labor, a lifelong diligent and persevering effort. By neglect of this trust we prove ourselves unfaithful stewards. No excuse for such neglect will be accepted by God. But, and now we come to the, the paragraph in particular, but those who have been guilty of neglect are not to despair. Is that encouraging? Yes. Most encouraging. The woman whose coin was lost searched until she found it. So in love, faith and prayer, that parents work for their households until with joy they can come to God saying, Behold, I am the children whom the Lord hath given me. Isaiah 8 and verse 18. This is true home missionary work and it is as helpful to those who do it as to those for whom it is done. Now during the week of course you made the observation that the children save the parents and the parents save the children. Here it says that it is as helpful to those who do it as to those for whom it is done. By our faithful interest for the home circle we are fitting ourselves to work for the members of the Lord's family with whom if loyal to Christ we shall live through eternal ages. For our brethren and sisters in Christ we are to show the same interest that as members of one family we have for one another. And God designs that all this shall fit us to labour for still others. So, there's the, mm, so there is an extremely precious promise. We thank Sharon for, for bringing it to our attention. And uh, it demonstrates the fact that we and our children are to be signs and wonders. In other words, we and our children are to possess in ourselves the evidence that the Holy Spirit has been a regenerating power to abolish the spirit of disobedience from us and our children and to institute the spirit of obedience in us and our children. So both the parent and the child is a witness to the regenerating power of God. And that's been one of the, to me one of the most wonderful revelations of truth God has given to us in this, in this series of camp meetings this year. Right, now, are there any questions that you'd like to ask this morning? Yes. Could you uh, maybe explain uh, Mark 9.49 bit there if possible? I'm glad you say uh, it could maybe be possible. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what the verse says. Let's see if we can maybe possibly explain Mark 9.49. Was 9.49? Yeah. Right, let's see what the scripture has to say. First of all, I question you, of course, that... Um, the, uh, a child can ask questions that the wisest man can't answer, so don't, don't be confident you'll get an answer. <laughs> you can always hide behind that. Okay, well this is one of those scriptures that, that are used by, um, by um, the world to... Um, uh, Mark 9, we'll start a little earlier actually. We'll go back to verse 42 and we'll read right down to verse 15 to get the text in its context. And whosoever shall offend in one shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea and if thy hand offend thee cut it off it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched and if thy foot offend, offend thee cut it off it is better for thee to enter halt into life and having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not and the, and the fire is not quenched and if thine eye offend thee we have the same story and again the thought is repeated in verse 48 where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched so now we've got three texts which say that the consuming worm never dies and the fire is never put out we have of course other statements in the word of God which indicate that uh, we don't have an eternally burning hell um, however if we go across to Revelation chapter 14 we do have a similar verse there which says that the smoke of their torment is set up forever and ever and they that have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and so forth let's read now verse 11 or well, let's go back to verse 10 Revelation 14 verse 10 the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whoso receiveth the mark of his name now does not the scripture apparently offer a very conclusive proof to those who believe in an eternally burning hell. 
doesn't appear to, or both these appear to write. Now, once again, this comes back to the point that um, it is a question of how the Bible uses these words, not a question of how we would use them. In the book Behold Your God, we have a chapter there entitled The Bible, Its Own Dictionary. I think that's the title of the chapter in the book, isn't it? I think. It's called that. And uh, we have to face the fact, of course, that the Bible was written over a space of something like two and a half thousand years, from Moses, the first writer, down to John the Revelator. And since the days of John again, we have another getting up toward, a thou toward 2,000 years. It's the, 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 the second millennium is about to, will be, or the third millennium rather, will begin in just about 17 years from now, if time lasts that long, of course. And uh, we know, for instance, how language changes during, during our own lifetimes. For instance, um, let me just think now, um, uh, you heard the emperor say, well, that's real smooth. It doesn't mean smooth like we mean smooth, does it? <laughs> what are some of the other expressions uh, that, that are used these days? Anyway, language is definitely changing its meaning. Now, for instance, in, in the King James Version, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, we read there a text which says, We shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now, the word prevent today means to stop. But when, that, when, when this translation was made, that word prevent mean, meant to proceed or to go before. So that word has quite changed its meaning in the last couple of hundred years. So therefore, in order to, we, ha we have to respect the fact then that words have changed their meaning since the Bible was first written, and so we have to understand how the Bible uses those words, not the way we would today use those words. Otherwise, it would mean that um, if in every generation people, people read the Bible according to their definitions of words, then we'd find that the people, shall we say, 400 years BC would read it, would get a different message from those a thousand years AD or even down today, right? Now the word for ever and ever in our modern language means eternally. It means unceasingly. It means it has no ending, no stopping point. But uh, when you go back to the Old Testament and uh, read, and I don't, I don't have at my fingertips the the verses anymore. So it's a long time since I uh, looked these up. But if any of you have access to F.D. Nichols' book entitled Answers to Objections, you'll find that he very, very successfully explains the way in which these verses have been understood. He gives the Old Testament examples. Now, for instance, there were several which said, God said to the Israelites that, that they were to observe the Passover forever throughout their generations, forever and forever. And yet we know perfectly well, of course, when we come to the New Testament era, that the Holy Spirit through Paul and the other apostles plainly taught that that service was ended at that point of time. Now the usage of the word forever and ever throughout the scriptures soon shows that that word means forever or continuously as long as it is intended to remain or go on. And if you apply that meaning to this fire which says their worm shall not die and, and the fire shall not be quenched, it simply means of course that while there remains any bodies uh, to feed upon the worms will go on living and while there's any rubbish to be burned the fire will go on burning in other words it'll be a continuous unbroken or it'll go on forever so long as it can go on forever that's, that's the idea that you find in those particular verses now, now of course those people who teach an ever burning hell are very careful to pick out these particular verses and ignore others which talk about um for instance, in Malachi, I said, well, we shall go out and walk on the ashes of the wicked, and they shall be as though they had not been, and um, God will make a new heavens and a new earth, and the fire has done its work. But the idea that Christ is conveying, and the Bible is conveying in this forever, or their worm not dying, and their fire not going out, is the idea when that fire begins to burn, there's nothing will put it out until there's nothing more to burn. That's the idea. And, and That's good, but I really wanted verse 49. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> for everyone that shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt uh, what does your version say Linda for that verse I, I don't have my Bible in here oh, I'm sorry um, well, look at that I, with all that work for nothing <laughs> <laughs> what's that pardon we didn't know the answers to the ones you gave us. Oh, I see. What was, the, what was the text in Malachi for us? Uh, Malachi 4 verse 3, I think, or something like that. Um, Malachi is a very small book, so very, very quickly find it. Uh, no, it's, not, it's Malachi. 
Yes, Malachi 4 verse 3. And you shall tread down the, the wicked, for they shall be ashes under your, the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, I don't think I really have an immediate answer for verse 49 in, in Mark chapter 9, um, excepting perhaps um, if we go back to the Old Testament, then uh, we find that there was at least some sacrifice where it says here, every sacrifice should be salted with salt. And we probably find in the Old Testament that uh, salt was mingled with every burnt offering and the salt, no doubt, uh, served as a purifying agent in, in, uh, in this work, which and I think the thought is that um, the mingling of salt with the fire is a means of certifying the total purification of what is being burned. And of course the final fire is a cleansing fire which will... Um, which will cleanse the entire uh, world, this world, and of course the universe in terms of this world in particular from every trace of sinfulness and prepare the way for the new heavens and new earth which will follow. So at the moment that's about the best answer I'll give you which probably isn't very adequate. Any other questions? Well right down there at the end of 50 it says have salt in yourself and have peace one with another. Well, of course, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's some good comments on that in, in Mount of Blessing on what that salt represents by way of a uh, preserving agency in the world. Salt is a preserver as well, isn't it? Salted meat and other stuff keeps it, doesn't go bad. Do you have another question? Um, if nobody has one directly off the Bible, I, I would like to hear a little bit... Um, I don't know too much about the, how Brinsmead started up and how that got going and exactly how he fulfilled any particular mm -hmm. prophecy. Uh -huh. okay. I would like to know a little bit of that history and exactly what he preached and taught and such things like that. It's going to be on that tape for me, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, a little bit of history would take a little bit of time, but I'll try and be very, I'll have to be very brief as it's already five to, ten to, uh, 5, 10 to 11 and uh, we'll soon have to start the baptismal service. Have you, have you certified that uh, tool yet? I'm going to call you from it. Did you, ask, up did you ask them to call you back, did you? Yeah. In the end, okay. I'll call them back. So, uh, all right then. Um, well, first of all, we have two predictions in the spirit of prophecy, one of which says that um, in testaments to ministers, I've forgotten the page, so don't ask me for the page number, it's not hard to find if you have the book that somebody is to come in the spirit and power of Elijah and when he has come men may say you are too much in earnest let me tell you how to do your work at the same time in, in Malachi the third the fourth chapter rather about the last verse in the chapter which is about verse 5 or 6 we find that um, the Lord says he will send Elijah the prophet before that great and terrible day of the Lord come now this prophecy which is verse 5 and 6 of Malachi chapter 4, is to have a double application, an application in, in, in Elijah the man and in Elijah the people. In the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, in the reference that uh, covers this, this um, scripture, uh, volume 4, page 1184, uh, Sister White talks about the Elijah people going forth to give the last warning message to, to a perishing world not just Elijah the man but Elijah the people but at the same time Sister White said in Testament to Minister, uh, uh, somebody a person is to come and when he has come and so forth so therefore we have to think that we have to look for Elijah the man and Elijah the people alright then now to help us to understand this we need to go back first of all to the original Elijah and look at his relationship to, uh, to what came after him. So here was the original Elijah, the prophet. Now he was followed by the ministry of Elisha who, who trained prophets and then as a result there were many prophets who went out from the school which Elisha had established, many prophets. Now note the contrast between the work of Elijah and the work of Elisha. The work of Elijah was tearing down, wasn't it? It was shaking up the foundations of great apostasy. Elijah went before King Ahab and said to him, 
the Lord God of heaven says there'll be no rain until you repent didn't he then he walked out of, a, of Ahab's presence and something over three years later he confronted the king again and they had this big showdown on Mount Carmel which literally destroyed the power of the priests of Baal to a large extent now this was a very spectacular work a very dramatic work but by contrast what sort of ministry do we find Elisha performing a tearing down or a building up Right, a building up. The found the Elijah having swept away the rubbish and error that was on the foundations, left the foundations clean now for Elisha to build up by a quiet but very effective teaching ministry. Okay, and that that of course prepared the schools of the prophets who went forth and, and worked a wonderful work of reformation amongst the Israelites. Now let's see if we don't find the same pattern exactly repeated in the experience of John the Baptist and that which followed him so now put the name here of John and we read of course from Matthew chapter 11 the very last no uh, I just forgot the verse that was about the middle of the chapter Jesus plainly says that John was Elijah the prophet but not, not of course in person Elijah was very much in heaven at this time and uh, Elijah didn't come down to be beheaded John the Baptist was John the Baptist he was the antitype of the Elijah of the Old Testament the prophesied one who had come now who followed his work Jesus and do we find now the work of John was like the work of Elijah a tearing down of, of uh, deep seated apostasies and old traditions and so forth and was the work of Jesus like the work of Elisha and didn't Christ run a school of the prophets and who were those prophets? Apostles. Right, those prophets were the apostles. Okay. And of course, they went forth in the awesome power of the um, Holy Spirit to give the message in former rain power. So there was the former rain which marked their particular ministry. Now, in these last days, Sister Wise says, Elijah the man, uh, here's Elijah the man, and here's Elijah the people. That's clear, isn't it? No problem, right? And of course, in between is the teaching ministry which prepares the Elijah people after the Elijah the man has prepared the way. So we're looking today to find this pattern repeated because Sister White again says, somebody is to come. Now, if somebody is to come, could it have been she? No. Impossible. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, she was not... It was not, she was not that person because she said she said somebody is to come. Now, we know that very soon, we're living today, of course, in the very shadow of the latter rain, so I'll put down, um, well, the one for the thousand will be the ultimate result, but anyway, the, um, the, the, I'll put down the fourth angel's movement. The fourth angel's movement. Right, now, they will go forth in the power, not of the former, but in the power of the latter rain, now, in order to be qualified to do this work, what must they first of all go through? They must go through a school. And inasmuch as the fourth angel's movement or the latter rain is, is the very next event in the drama, what must we expect to be in progress today? The school, right? Okay, so we today have the school. Let's, let's write that down. And all of us are in that school. Christ is again the teacher we are learning the principles and developing the experience and, and the character necessary to participate in that latter rain period. Now, if we're in school today and the latter rain is the very next event, then who must already have come and gone? Elijah the man. Elijah the man, right? Elijah the man. Now, who is the only possible person who qualify for that position? Benzmeen, right? the only possible person who could qualify for that position. Now you may say, well there's some problems here because uh, brings me to apostatize. So what? We're not concerned about what happened to him after his work was done. We're concerned only with the work he did under God's personal direction. Now Elijah was translated. So if we're, go if we're going to demand that whatever happens to the man after his work is done happens to the next man, then how come John was beheaded? So it's a very different end of the story, isn't it? And the parallel ends with the end of their work. Now, for instance, Elijah was not translated until his work was finished. John was not beheaded until his work was done. And Brisbane did not apostatize until his work was done. So what happens to them after is inconsequential. That's not a part of the pattern at all. 
and um, and so um, it's very clear to my mind, <coughs> abundantly clear, that that Brinsmead was in fact the Elijah, and and what he taught back there in the late fifties and early nineteen sixties was were great truths that we still subscribe to, excepting for the fact, of course, that. Um, we have uh, been delivered from some of the errors which um, did attend the early preaching back in those days. Uh, for instance, he taught very plainly that in 1888 God sent the message of the fourth angel. We still believe that. He taught we must enter into the open door into the most holy place. We still believe that. He taught that Christ came in sinful, fallen, mortal flesh and blood. We still believe that. He did teach uh, some errors in regards to the cleansing of the sanctuary, which we don't believe, of course, today. But then William Miller had gross errors in his teaching too to begin with, and uh, li like likewise with William Miller and the Apostles of Jesus Christ. And if you're looking for a man who has a flawless and perfect message uh, to begin a movement, you'll never find such a man, will you? Never. Because the traditions of the old of the time past are too deeply embedded, of course, in, in the thinking of the, uh, of the people. And so we find then that... Um, the Brinsmead movement began roughly in the mid-50s and exactly as Elijah went before the king at that point of time and said to that king, there'll be no rain till you repent. So Brinsmead also went before the kings and who were the kings in his day? No, in General Brinsmead's day. Pardon? General right, the General Conference president and his high officers. They were the, they, they, well, the president was the king, of course, and the high officers were his... Uh, courtiers and so forth and Brinsby said to them in the power of God to be no latter rain for the Adventist church unless you repent and isn't, isn't that the truth yeah. right did they repent yeah. no so they will never have the latter rain no way in the world will they have the latter rain so we today are very much a people of prophecy aren't we very much a people of prophecy we're in school as Christ's apostles were back here and as Elisha's students in the school of the prophets were back there and just as those apostles emerged from that training to become the mightiest preachers of all time up to that date, so you folk are about to merge from this school to be the mightiest of all preachers in all human history. One thirty and three. Eleven thirty and twelve. It's occupied. I see. We can't have the baptism until up to one thirty. No, isn't that a bit of a difficulty? All right. Well then. Um, as we go to the lake. Which is just about as long, I guess. Uh, well, I guess we'll just... Um, hmm? What's the difficulty with 130? Well, it sort of mess messes up the afternoon a bit. But we'll be, fin we'll be finished by 2. So tell them, tell them 130. Okay. Is that okay? We just one second. Is that okay, 130? Finished by 2? We don't care. No objections, so go ahead. All right then, that gives us more time to talk about the history of the movement in that case. <laughs> now, occasionally people rise up in this movement and they, um, they, they object to the fact that um, largely, if not entirely, the light of this truth comes through one person. And occasionally I hear the cry, this is a one-man movement, I don't go along with one-man movements. And what the person is really saying, of course, that they want to be another one-man one messenger through whom God will transmit his light and truth. But um, the people in this movement have no reason to envy my position in the slightest because uh, your position is the enviable one. If we can talk about envy, of course, Christians don't talk about envy anyway, do they? <coughs> because with a Christian, we're not concerned about position. We're only concerned with being where God wants us to be and doing what God wants us to do. But um, from the point of view of, uh, if, if you were given the preference, if you were given the preference, or the choice I should say, as to whether you'd occupy the, my position today or your position tomorrow, and your position tomorrow of course would be that position where, um, um, like the apostles of old, you'd be filled and supercharged with the indwelling presence of God's Spirit, and you'll go out and you'll heal the sick, You'll, you'll uh, heal the blind, you'll see thousands of converts in a single day, whereas I've laboured for 30 years to see less than a thousand people around the world. So if you had the choice, which would you rather have? 
The answer is rather obvious, isn't it? It's, it's rather obvious. So um, I, I can begin to to paint before you the glory of your future. Absolutely, the glory of your future. And of course, it's going to be a very tough future too at the end of that glorious period. But uh, every person in this room of faithful most certainly can be one of the 144,000 who will be the most privileged people that history has ever produced. The people who will, who will walk nearest to Christ at all eternity, his special bodyguard, his special co-workers. Wow, think about it. <laughs> it's too much, isn't it? <laughs> when you do think about it. And so it will be well worth your while to hang on until that, that time comes. Now, I, just to safeguard you from falling under the same delusion that so many people have succumbed to, I'd like to talk about a one-man movement for a moment. And um, in doing so, I stress the fact, of course, that what we have to recognize is what is God doing? What is God providing us? And we must give right away many thought of, what we, of how we think that God should run his movement. How is God working? And we're to work in harmony with the God of heaven instead of getting up ideas about, about how we think that maybe God should work. Now, if we go back again to this picture which we paint so often these days, the picture of God up in heaven above, and then Jesus Christ, and then the angels. And Christ, of course, was an angel in every sense of the word. He was also a God in every sense of the word. And as such, Jesus Christ possessed unique qualifications. Okay, one one thirty. Very good. Now, Jesus Christ possessed unique qualification which enabled him to fill a position which no other being in the universe could fill, not even God and the Holy Spirit could fill that position, right? Now, why did he occupy that position? Because he alone could occupy it. Only he, only he was qualified to occupy it. Now, what was Satan's gripe? He says, I don't like this one-man movement situation. Wasn't it? That's what he said, I don't like this one-man movement situation. And, and he wanted Christ to move over so he and Christ could run the show. That, that, was, that, was, that was his ambition. So really, his complaint about the one-man movement was really generated by an unholy ambition, wasn't it? Yeah. Right, an, an, an unholy ambition. And I've noticed that those people who begin complaining about the one-man movement in this, in this particular movement are people who, who manifest a desire to give themselves or to obtain a higher position than they presently have. That, that always seems to be the basis of their complaint. Now, think about this carefully now. If sin in heaven began over that issue, and if men and if angels and men lost their place in paradise because they could not accept God's way of running his own movement or his own government, then what test must we all overcome before we can get back into heaven? the same test and for that reason God has to set the test up upon this earth now for instance when you go to school your teachers organise a test don't they they sit down and they organise a test and they present that test to you and that's why then upon this earth God has set up that same situation we'll go back for instance to Moses that'll, that'll be a good starting point now who is the only person for whom God communicated to ancient Israel when Moses was alive the only person right and notice something, that every single rebellion that took place in the camp of Israel was over Moses' position. For Dathan and Abiram, Miriam and, Miriam and Aaron and so forth. And every person who could not accept the voice of God as it came from God through Jesus Christ and the angels and through Moses, that every person who could not accept God's way of working ended up where? Swallowed by earthquakes, bitten by serpents, or some other dreadful fate overtook them, didn't it? Yes. Now, Moses was followed by Joshua, and who, who was again once more the one person to whom God communicated. We come on down through quite a number. Let's come down to uh, Samuel. You read in Patriarchs and Prophets that Samuel was the sole, he was the sole prophet, priest, and judge of Israel. The sole prophet, priest, and judge of Israel. Now Israel said, we don't like this one-man movement. Give us a king like the kings around about us. And they got their king. And that time on, of course, we have a new system now which is no longer a picture of God's government but now a picture of man's rejection of God's government as we find the various kings. But even so, when God desired to communicate to his people, he called a prophet, prophet prophets like um, Elijah, uh, yes, Elijah, Elisha, uh, who else? And Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and so forth. 
and through those men God spoke to his people until we, until we come down to a one man messenger whose name was John the Baptist followed in turn by a one man messenger whose name was Jesus Christ but now we find a chain because now suddenly it's no longer a one man movement but it's a many man movement not only do we have 12 apostles through whom God spoke to the people but we also have other prophets such as the daughters of um, Philip wasn't it Philip's daughters um, it's forgotten now you know, there were other messengers as well so here we suddenly find a change in the pattern now why? there must be some reason mustn't there yeah? right then and here's the reason why when we, when we come now all of this from here right back to Moses and beyond of course go back to all the patriarchs if you wish that pointed back to the situation which existed up in heaven when the first rebellion took place but now in the, in, in the restoration we're not going to have a one man movement anymore that's, that's, that'll be a thing of the past when we get to heaven because and, all, and even up in heaven today it doesn't exist anymore once again there'll be God and then there'll be Christ but will he be alone now in that ministry? no, no. now there'll be many together with him and of course God will communicate both through Christ and the many down to the people throughout the entire universe um, the, the, the infinity of the universe now this then when the apostles were called they literally came very very close and they ought to have gone right through and uh, the kingdom should have been established in, in heaven so as they moved toward the new era then down upon this earth a picture of that new era was established in that situation now, now note something only those who accepted the one man ministry of John and the one man ministry of Jesus Christ were able to participate in the one man ministry of the apostles I mean in the many, in, in the many, um, the many ministries of the, of the apostles see that point only those who accepted what God was doing for John the Baptist and what God, God was doing for Jesus Christ were able to participate with God in this great work that's a very important point now when of course the apostolic church fell away and um, went back into apostasy again and the church was drawn way way back from the edges of the kingdom and they had to make a fresh start all over again and as you look down through history what do you find you find one man movements let's think for instance of John Wycliffe was he very much alone mm -hmm. right and you go on to Huss and then there was Jerome they, they, were, they were somewhat together those two in what we now call Czechoslovakia then you come down to John Wesley or Luther I should put Luther there of course right Luther well, they were in different countries of course and then we come down to Wesley in the 18th century and then we come to one man whose name was William Mellon we have one prophet only one prophet and that's, that's Ellen White during this period and then suddenly we have two we have Wagner and Jones now do you see any similarity between Wagner and Jones in their position the apostles back there was the church again on the edge of the kingdom mm -hmm. right so all of this then up to Wagner and Jones including Sister White again points back to what was and then we come back to my position today and here, here again we have one person to whom God has chosen to give the message right today so I just put today here but in the immediate future when the loud cry begins then will be fulfilled the words of Joel your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall see visions and, you, and your young men shall dream dreams so what does the prophecy call for in the immediate future? Amen. Lots of prophets. And I'm looking at the faces of future prophets this morning. What a privilege. <laughs> and so once again as we, and, and I believe that I am the last one man messenger in history and that you folk are the last uh, group messengers in history and that uh, your work likewise will point forward to that glorious time when we come to the kingdom above and in, enter in there. Now let me stress that I have never in the slightest degree discouraged anybody that um, I, I could plainly see the Lord had laid a burden on to work and, and consequently, consequently of course there are workers in Africa, workers in Europe or a worker in Europe, a little team in Europe of course there's Andreas Dura there with his little team of helpers but the facts are these that I have um, very very carefully committed myself to God to let him run this movement the way he wants to run it and when people say to me why don't you make room for other people I, I say there's all the room in the world for other people provide God puts them there and the worst thing in the world we could do of course is to start um, 
appointing workers because we think the work isn't done the right way. And um, I never ever chose to be a worker in this position. Is it not 45 minutes, is it? Sure enough. Don't we get carried away? Yeah, <laughs> you, want turn the, you want to turn the tape over?